Now another location that is also a very important site of precipitation is of course the shelf margin or the reef itself. And again, we can look at the example here from the, the, the Guadalupe mountain. And this is again right behind me. Now I'm going to draw the contour of where the, the reef association, and remember in this case, the reef association is mostly um, al algae and sponges and some bryozoans. And the reef is here, it's here in blue. So you can see we have here a very large cavity that was present in the reef. And this cavity was probably, um, you know, half a meter um, big wide and several meters across. So that's a very, very large pore. But as is obvious from the picture, all of that porosity was filled with cement and things. And in fact, if we look closely at it, what we see in this cavity is first, some phylloidal algae. So this is essentially algae colonizing the surface of that pore, of that, um, of that gross framework porosity, uh, as the first thing that essentially fills porosity. But then the second thing is those botryoidal cement. And what's fascinating is if you look closely at those botryoidal cement, you see a growth of the botryoidal cement, then that's interrupted by growth of phylloidal algae. So that is really an early marine process. The algae was still living there and sometimes it would basically colonize the surface of the mineral. And so botryoidal cement would stop growing. We'll just have a thin layer of the algae. And then we have one more layer of, of the botryoidal cement, which I think is absolutely fascinating. But what's also interesting is to see the volume of cement we have. This botryoidal cement literally fills all the cavities left in the, the reef. And in the end, when there's just a tiny bit of porosity left, it's filled with low stand clastic that essentially fall in the crack and fill the cavity. So sadly, the reef, which had a beautiful framework porosity to begin with here in the Guadalupian, is completely filled. So all the porosity is lost and that's true for the subsurface and for the outcrop. And that's why the reef, if you remember the, the class where we looked at the um, Permian Basin, the reef itself is not a reservoir. It's a pathway through fracture into the reservoir, which is in the back reef. That's not necessarily always the case in every carbonate system, but it's the case in this carbonate system. And what's the pump here for fluid circulation? Why do we have such extensive cementation? Well, it's very easy to understand. The pump for fluid is the wave crashing onto the reef because the reef is the barrier to wave energy. The wave that crashed onto the reef generates circulation into the reef and you can replace the pore volume of that reef multiple times, 600, 1000, 2000 times. And each time you precipitate a little bit of aragonite or high magnesium calcite and you slowly but surely within a few thousands of years or maybe tens of thousands of years, you completely fill and completely lose that porosity. Now, another place where you typically will see a lot of cementation is in the back reef and the strand line, the beach, for the same reason, because these places have a a significant uh, amount of energy in terms of wave crashing there. And uh, here's a beautiful example of a modern um, um, cemented oolitic shoal. You can see we have these beautiful oids and these oids are completely cemented here. We have no porosity. Now there are plenty of cases where porosity is preserved in oids, but in this case here in the Bahamas, everything is lost. We've lost completely the, the porosity. And then there's some interesting case if you look at the lagoon. Now in the lagoon, we have hard grounds. And these hard grounds are not always present in the lagoon, but they're not uncommon for the lagoon. And to understand why you can have hard ground in the lagoon, you need to remember what the water rock ratio means and what it is proportional to. We said it's proportional to flow. Well, we don't have a lot of flow in the lagoon. We also said it's proportional to the volume of water and time at which these sediments are um, exposed to that water. Now, what's interesting in this case is that if you don't have a lot of sedimentation in the lagoon, 
it implies that your sediments stay at the water sediment contact for longer. So we have a long time. And then even if you don't have a lot of flow, you can still by diffusion bring a lot of cations and anions into the site of mineralization. And that's how you form hard ground. And on this picture here, you see a typical hard ground coming from the Mycene, uh, from Australia actually. And what I want to point out to you are the um, iron crust around this hard ground, which indicates that this sediment must have been at uh, in contact with seawater for a long time because the concentration of iron in seawater is very low. So you need a long time to form those iron crusts. But also the evidence for boring, which indicates, uh, was, which is a sure sign that this was a hard surface at the water contact where these organisms were able to bore into the substrate. And here's another example that's a Cretaceous example. And you can even see another really typical feature of those hard grounds. So not only do you have, in this case, a manganese crust, but you have also the boring and you have some rip up class on top of the hard ground in that white sediment. That's when the current that maybe happen in the next sea level rise, so during the next transgressive system track, essentially ripped up pieces of that hard substrate and mixed it with the white sediment around. So these are classical signs for hard ground. And here's a figure to remember what we're looking for to call a hard ground a hard ground. A hard ground needs to be defined at the seafloor. So you need to be able to demonstrate that this cementation happened early whilst the sediments were in contact with seawater. And the best way to do this is to have either evidence for boring or which you, know, you can see by truncation of grain, you can see by the sediment on top filling into the boring uh, cavity, or you can have evidence of expansion ridge where the cement essentially crack the, the surface of the sediments of the hard ground and form those expansion ridge, very similar to the TP structure we saw earlier in the class, but in this case, a much smaller scale than this. Um, you can also have evidence of encrusting by organisms. So if encrusting organisms have colonized the substrate, it means the substrate was hard at the time when the organism lived. And finally, we talked about the evidence that you could have those rip up clasts um, as well. So all of these are classical evidence for hard grounds. So what have we learned in this class? Well, we've learned that the shallow water environment which is the environment in which the tea factory, the most common factory grows, is warm, it's warm water, and it's super saturated in aragonite and in calcite. This means that this is an environment of net porosity loss because we will have cementation and we are not likely to have dissolution. We've also learned that all three most common minerals are possible in this marine environment. That means we can have aragonite, we can have magnesium calcite, and we can have Lomag calcite. We've seen the process of micritization that happens straight at the seafloor, a very important process that can create micritization envelope, and micrite is a, both a, a sediment and a cement, so it will lead to early cementation. And also it will give uh, porosity and permeability characteristics very different than if you only had the grain. So that's an important process to keep in mind. In terms of pump for seawater to generate this uh, cementation, water um, is moved mostly by wave action. So the wave crashing on the reef or on the back reef or at the strand line will generate circulation of water uh, in the sediment and that's your most common pump. However, if you are in a lagoon or in a protected environment, and if there is low sedimentation rates, then it means that your sediment surface stays in contact with seawater for a long time, and thus your water rock ratio is also high because of the time, the duration of exposure. So in our next class, we'll look at dolomitization in the marine environment, which we've not tackled yet. Oh, 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 oh,